We've talked a lot on this channel about how wars are deterred or fought. Less often talked about is how and why they end. Because unless you're England and France, most countries aren't going to be content to fight wars forever. And even those two foes eventually settled down and became allies after centuries of on and off warfare. But while wars are almost universally destructive, the ways that they begin and end are incredibly diverse. And so today I thought it was worth asking the question of why some wars seem to resolve so quickly, while others persist for painful years or even decades. It means understanding the theory behind conflict termination, the ways that you can assess the trends of a given conflict, some of the historical barriers to conflict resolution, and some of the ways in which a conflict, short of a crushing military victory by either side, can be brought to something like a peaceful conclusion. All right, so what am I going to be talking about today? I'm going to start with the idea of war as a form, for lack of a better term, of negotiation, albeit a particularly aggressive kind of negotiation, essentially highlighting that when a war starts, it's usually with a particular political policy goal in mind. Then I'll look at some of the factors that inform how a war is likely to proceed and provide a sort of overarching rational framework for how nations might use military force in order to try and get the outcome that they want. Then, having set down a rational framework, I'm going to explain why people, and therefore nations, often aren't rational, and what that can mean for the way wars are fought and come to an end. Then I'm going to talk about some of the overarching ways in which wars can end, with final peace treaties, total victories, temporary ceasefires, etc., before finally asking the question, if you are trying to bring a war to a close with a solution short of salting the earth and deleting the name of your enemies from all history books, what are some of the general steps nations can often take to increase the odds of a potential peace deal? In doing this, I want to stress this video is not about how the war in Ukraine ends. I'll use some examples to illustrate points, but to do that topic justice would require a deep dive into the military capacity, the trends, the economics, and the politics of all involved. That's complicated by the huge number of unknowns and the fact that it would, generally speaking, help to have the theory in place first. Okay, so before we talk about ending wars, it helps to think about why nations might start one in the first place. It's an interesting question because I'm sure most of you listening wouldn't start a war if you were suddenly given the reins of a major country. Congratulations, that probably means you're a good person, but by the standards of most of human history, it would also make you a bad ruler. Because in swearing off war, you'd be swearing off what used to be one of the primary tools of state power and policy. As best as we can tell from human history, most wars have been started to achieve certain objectives. Now, those objectives may be stupid, but they usually do exist. A state trying to achieve certain objectives could look at the various options available, of which war would be one option in their toolkit. And whenever you point that out, it's usual for someone to bring in von Clausewitz as saying that war is an extension of politics by other means. Just breaking out that one-liner, however, both undercuts the depth of what von Clausewitz was trying to say, but also fails to differentiate war properly from all the other policy options that are usually available to government. As an option, war is special. In some ways, it's more limited than other policy options. There are a whole bunch of things, for example, that war is completely useless in helping you solve. If you want to increase educational or healthcare outcomes in your nation, starting a war with your neighbour is not going to help you do it. Instead, war is primarily going to be useful when the goal is to either take something from a neighbour or another country or encourage them to alter their behaviour or policy. And in that scenario, there's something that sets war apart from the other negotiation options you might have available. In most negotiations, you would try and offer something in exchange for something in return, bargaining and eventually find a mutually agreeable deal. You might play dirty, you might apply pressure, but at the end of the day, you need the other side's consent, grudging or otherwise, in order to get whatever it is you want to get. But the thing about negotiations is that in the absence of a deal, the default option is always no. If America one day decided that it really wanted Newfoundland from Canada, it could offer them trillions of dollars to transfer the territory. It could threaten to impose trade sanctions or isolate them internationally. It could make the deal as sweet or bitter as it wanted. But at the end of the day, in an ordinary negotiation, the Canadians could always say no. And in a situation like that, a historical ruler or a modern ruler still thinking in 19th century terms might see war as an attractive option. Because while ultimately you need consent to negotiate for something, you don't need it to simply go and take it. And if you are looking to push another country to adopt a particular policy or give up something particularly unpalatable, then starting a war can allow you to bring a lot more coercive force to the table in order to encourage them to change their minds. So that's probably a good place to start, discussing how nations set war goals and how they try and use coercion to achieve them. 
So for the purpose of this video, congratulations, Prime Minister. I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is you are now in charge, and the bad news is your country is at war. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to try to understand how to bring that war to an end, without, of course, imposing unacceptable costs on your nation in the process. Now, the first response many people are going to have when you ask them how to end a war is to say, well, just open negotiations. The problem is, when a war begins, usually there's going to be very little to negotiate because the negotiating positions of both sides are going to be very, very far apart to the point where no deal is immediately possible. If that weren't the case, the war probably wouldn't have started in the first place. War is a pretty extreme and risky option, so you would hope that most leaders wouldn't opt for it if there was any chance of just talking it out. It's also worth pointing out that no two wars are likely to be entirely alike, and that will influence how easy they are to end. A religiously motivated war of annihilation between two states, for example, is probably going to be harder to negotiate an end to than, say, for example, a border skirmish between two colonial powers. Academics have used a variety of factors to classify different sorts of war throughout history, and just as an example, I've listed the elements according to Rob Johnson there. But the key here is that wars can be very different from one another, and as a result, a model for war termination that applies in one case might be all but useless in another. But if you do want a generalized model, imagine both sides as having their own war goals or target objectives, their negotiating position, if you will. If the war is over something relatively minor, these might be relatively close together. But in a more extreme case, they may literally be existential, that is, the war goal of one nation threatens the very existence of the other. The example I have up on the screen here is an attacker seeking to annex all the territory of a defender. While the defender would very much like to continue existing, keep all their territory, and would like monetary reparations to rebuild their country. A negotiated settlement might require both sides agreeing on a target end state, and somehow bridging the vast gap between their mutually exclusive war goals. And of course, it would probably be wrong to argue that both sides should just meet somewhere in the middle to solve every conflict. Sometimes even a compromised position would pose an existential danger to a state, an unacceptable cost to its population, represent something manifestly unjust or unreasonable, or a defender may just want to resist any demands being made by an attacker so as not to encourage other powers to attempt aggressions of their own. For example, if you come home from doing the shopping and find that someone has occupied your home, your first response probably isn't going to be just trying to bargain them down to only taking the kitchen in the backyard. It's your home, and they can either remove themselves or be removed. In this national law, that's kind of how recognized borders, the prohibition on wars of aggression, and the right to self-defense is supposed to work. But assuming you have a situation where the negotiating positions are very far apart, then the next step is to apply increasing amounts of coercive pressure until someone changes their mind. In that mode of thinking, the war that follows is just a process by which both sides are trying to convince the other to accept a new state of affairs, a new strategic reality. Both sides apply military, economic, and political pressure until the respective negotiation positions are modified enough that a deal becomes possible. The Americans might decide, for example, they want Newfoundland from Canada, but after four or five years of dealing with persistent Canadian resistance, decide that, you know what, they didn't really want it after all. It's important to note here that the very act of applying military pressure has costs associated with it, often in terms of lives, treasure, materiel, or international diplomatic blowback. And so it is hypothetically possible to apply pressure in a way that does more damage to you than it does to your opponent. History is replete, for example, of generals leading armies into disease-ridden areas and getting most of their force lost without ever meeting the enemy. When the French invaded Madagascar in 1894, for example, they insisted on doing so during the rainy season and promptly lost a third of the force to disease. Approximately 6,000 would reportedly die due to conditions like malaria, dysentery, or typhoid. They would still win, but by comparison, they lost 25 killed in combat. In those scenarios, it can actually be possible to wear down an opponent by just waiting for them to do it to themselves. As long as your opponent is sufficiently stupid about the way in which they apply force, the more force they apply, the greater your relative advantage can actually become. But assuming that most involved understand things like what a mosquito is, being able to apply more force, all else being equal, will generally strengthen rather than weaken your negotiating position. So if we understand that war often includes the grisly business of applying military pressure in order to get an opponent to modify their negotiating position, how then might you as a leader try and chart a path for your country towards a resolution that you can likely accept? Now, in a perfectly rational world where every kindergartner is introduced to game theory right after finger painting 101, 
then the decisions around the conduct of a war and its termination would follow some sort of rational calculus. To put forward a very simplified model to illustrate the point, let's just say a leader is in the middle of the war, well, of course, they would have to ask themselves a series of questions. Firstly, what are the broad strategic options available to me? I could, for example, accept whatever deal my opponent is currently offering, or I could endure in the war as it is, or escalate it in the hopes of getting a better deal. I would look at the costs involved in each of those options, the likely outcomes that those decisions would give me, including all the probabilities and feedback involved. So for example, I would take account of the fact that if I gave in to my opponent, they might be encouraged to try again in the future, or that others might view me as weak and also choose to attack to try and get concessions. I'd take all of that into account, and then I would choose whatever option available to me was, on net, the least bad. To do that requires a significant amount of information, including an acknowledgement that war is at minimum a two-player game. Whatever I choose to do, my opponent is going to get a vote, a chance to respond. And this is one of the great traps that over-optimistic analysts can sometimes fall into. If you assume your opponent will respond in the way you would like them to, as opposed to the way they actually will do, then your modelling is not going to be accurate. And so it's often as important to understand your opponent's goals as it is to understand your own. What are they trying to achieve? How much pain are they likely willing to endure in order to get it? How flexible are they likely to be in negotiations? And where are they going to sit on the spectrum between rational and irrational? As you start bringing this information together, you can begin to chart out the large grand strategic decisions that now have to be made. In this situation, as discussed earlier, you have a couple of options available to you. You could escalate, you could persist, that is just carry on the war as you are now, or you can accept whatever deal your opponent is offering you. And in trying to decide what option you take, you're going to try and evaluate what the likely results of making that choice will be. If you accept the deal your opponent is offering, for example, you're pretty much guaranteed a particular outcome. You will get the peace treaty that they are currently offering. Now that's great, that's a 100% chance of ending the war, but on the other hand, the deal they're offering might be complete shit and you might want to fight instead. Now, nothing is certain in war, but you can try and make estimates as to some of the potential results. For example, in this scenario, we're estimating that if we just persist with the war as it is, there's a 15% chance we win, a 50% chance we have to sign a peace treaty more or less along the lines of what our opponent is suggesting, 30% chance that there's just a ceasefire, the fighting eventually dies out, and a 5% chance that our country collapses and everything is terrible. If we escalate, however, we're going for broke. We massively increase the chance that we win overall, but we also double the chance that our country collapses, and again, everything is terrible. If you then want to take a very cold robotic view of what the best course of action is, then what you need to do is weigh up the costs of these various options, the value of those potential outcomes, decide your risk tolerance, and make a choice. I might assess, for example, that fighting harder is going to cost me more men, munitions, and funding than giving up right now or fighting at a lower intensity would. And so in that scenario, I give accepting the deal a value of zero, persisting with the war as it stands a value of negative two to represent the pain it causes me, and escalating by contrast with those greater casualties and costs, I assign that a value of negative four. Then I look at all the potential outcomes on my side, how much value I attribute to, for example, an increased chance of winning a victory and I assign that a value modified by its probability. I might decide that I really value the lives of soldiers that will be lost continuing or escalating the war, but I might value more the chance to hold on to my right to political self-determination or to hold on to territories that are home to millions of members of my civilian population. And so if I think there is a significant chance that by fighting longer or harder, I might achieve those outcomes, then the logical model might dictate that for the moment at least, I choose to fight on or to escalate. To go back to the example of someone occupying your home, for example, calling the police to throw them out imposes a relatively low cost, maybe a negative one. Losing access to your home is probably a significant cost to you, so getting it back successfully is probably a high value, say a five or a six. So you're going to choose to call the cops rather than negotiate or simply give away your home. But as clean as this might all seem, it does leave a massive open question. How do you calculate those percentages and costs? How do you determine what the likely outcome is if a war continues to be fought? Because ultimately, that's the outcome you're going to be left with if you don't end up with a negotiated settlement. Well, you're probably going to try and get good data on some of the key factors that help influence how a war resolves, and use those to inform your projections.
From a material or defence economic perspective, you're going to ask yourself a couple of questions. What are the resources available to both sides? How willing are they to leverage and deploy those resources? And how effectively and efficiently are those resources used? That last point brings in the whole breadth of the operational art, tactics and strategy. If you have more tanks than your opponent, but believe that tanks should be used primarily as single-use minesweepers, then you're not efficiently using your resources. The second question isn't about the aggregates, it isn't about total combat power resources, it's about whether or not there are any particular points of vulnerability or single points of failure in the overall war effort. If you have the largest artillery park in the world, but only stockpiled enough ammunition to last half a day, congratulations, you have a single point of failure. Then you can ask a full range of other questions that we've talked about before. What is the attitude of society? Do they support the war or oppose it? What sort of sacrifices are they willing to make? Will either or both sides enjoy international support? How much? How reliably? How enduringly? If Serbia invaded Montenegro in a vacuum, I'd bet on Serbia. But in the real world where Montenegro could smack the Article 5 button, then suddenly a Serbian victory is about as likely as a push bike winning the Formula 1. Now obviously both sides have an incentive to put a spin one way or the other on their available resources. I've taken shots at plenty of completely out there Russian claims in the past. The 1600 T90M tanks per year, for example, comes to mind. But it's certainly not a one-sided problem. Recently, for example, there was a Bloomberg article which argued that Ukraine might actually have more tanks and certain other systems active now than Russia does. That's something which might bolster morale on the pro-Ukrainian side. The problem is, there's a variety of problems with the data and the approach, which mean it's almost certainly wrong. To name just a few, it assumes that every piece of equipment Ukraine captures, it is able to repair and put back into service. It narrows the definition of heavy artillery pieces to just 152 and 155 mm artillery, conveniently leaving out 122 mm guns, which make up the bulk of Russia's artillery reserves. But most importantly, while it gives Ukraine credit for all of the equipment it has received from overseas backers, it assumes that Russia has produced no new equipment and reactivated zero equipment from storage. I feel like that's kind of a pretty conspicuous thing to leave out. It'd be kind of like saying I beat Fernando Alonso in a road race while leaving out the fact that we were both driving two-seaters and my car was actually driven by Lewis Hamilton. Incredibly deep stockpiles of ammunition and equipment are one of the defining strengths of the Russian army, and you can't just leave them out. And it's an especially glaring omission, considering it is relatively easy to watch hundreds of pieces of reactivated Russian equipment disappearing from arsenals and storage yards almost on a monthly basis. As I'll talk about more later, if you're trying to effectively plan the end of a conflict, having an accurate picture of it matters. And I'd suggest putting out graphs like the previous one arguably significantly misrepresent the likely state of the battlefield and the enormity of the task that Ukraine still has to overcome. To get back to that question of trying to project how well a military will fight in a prolonged or high-intensity war, hunting for points of failure becomes a significant activity, if they exist. Advanced militaries, like advanced economies, are incredibly complex bits of organisational machinery. They require dozens or hundreds of critical inputs, and the absence of any one of those can severely degrade the effectiveness of the force. And so shortages or points of vulnerability can mean as much for how a war is fought as those things that are available in significant surplus. Because if you're trying to get some rough idea of when a military might degrade in a serious way, hunting for potential points of failure and when they might kick in is one way to do it. And from a negotiating perspective, if I know my opponent's military might start breaking down if I just apply a particular sort of pressure or carry on for just a few more months, then that is what I am likely to do. The thing you're looking for here is what might break down or run out first. Imagine, for example, there are two survivors working their way through the desert. I tell you that one of them has 30 days of food with them and the other has 10 days. Which one will survive longer? But before you answer, I tell you it doesn't actually matter, because the bloke with 30 days worth of food only has one day's worth of water, whereas the other bloke has five days. At that point, it doesn't matter if you have 500 days worth of food and a super tanker's worth of petrol for your car. The water is non-negotiable, and once it's gone, so are you. Side note here to any tourists thinking of exploring the outback without preparing properly, please don't. If you're looking for historical examples of weak links in a nation's warfighting capacity, 
Then oil for Germany in World War II is probably a good one. Germany was constrained by oil and fuel availability almost throughout the war. Even when there was enough ostensibly to meet military requirements, it required starving civilian sectors of fuel to operate. Occupied territories like France, for example, were far less productive than they would have been if they'd been allocated sufficient fuel and energy resources. By the late war, fuel shortages were impacting just about everything to do with the German military. Pilots and tank crews couldn't get as many training hours as they should because the fuel just wasn't there. German operations, like the famous Battle of the Bulge, were constrained by fuel supply. And as Allied bombing began to severely degrade synthetic fuel production, the situation was only going to get worse. Even if by some industrial miracle, Germany had doubled or tripled its production of aircraft, tanks and armoured vehicles, that wouldn't necessarily translate into much additional combat power, because there simply wouldn't have been the fuel to run them. The Germans may have had the world's first operational jet fighter, but the Allies had Texas and its oil fields. And if you're in a war and understand your opponent has that sort of vulnerability, it's going to inform your negotiating position and the decisions you make. If you get this process wrong, you can end up predicting the results to conflicts in a way that just doesn't make sense. The classic example here is manpower and a focus above all on national population. If country A, the argument goes, has several times the population of country B, then country B should just surrender because inevitably country A will win a war of attrition. This is presumably why, were the two countries suddenly bolted together, the army of Kenya would obviously defeat that of Finland. Or at least I presume it would until Finland activated its mobilisation system, pulled out its artillery reserves and activated its modern air force. I've seen a number of manpower-based arguments being made in relation to the war in Ukraine and how it's likely to end. And make no mistake, manpower, especially trained manpower, is valuable, and generating more through acts like mobilisation comes at a cost to the economy and the population. But that doesn't mean manpower is likely to be the determining factor, the military failure point, the point on which negotiation should be based. And to prove that point, even if you take Russian official claims from Sergei Shoigu directly as to what they say Ukrainian casualties were in September, and extrapolate that out for the days since September, you would end up with a Russian claim of roughly 250,000 Ukrainian casualties since the 2022 invasion. That notably is both killed and wounded. As morbid as it is, at those rates by historical standards, it would take potentially decades to bleed out a country with the population of Ukraine. The shortages are likely to be in firepower, not manpower. But just because that's the case with this war doesn't mean that's true of all wars. And in some cases, available military manpower may actually be the main point of vulnerability for a military. For the famous Pyrrhus of Epirus, the bloke who gave us the term Pyrrhic victory, manpower was a limitation. Pyrrhus would defeat his Roman opponents in multiple battles, usually inflicting far more casualties than he took. But his Roman opponents had the blood to spare and always came back for more, leading to historians attributing to Pyrrhus the famous phrase, if we are victorious in one more battle with the Romans, we will be ruined. All words to that effect. For World War I Russia, the breakpoint, the point of vulnerability, was social and political. The Germans didn't have to march all the way to St. Petersburg and take it. Revolutionaries did that for them. And that last example does help segue into an interesting point, And that is the very real historical phenomenon of war enthusiasm and war exhaustion. Often when a country goes to war, it will experience temporary war enthusiasm. People rushing to enlistment offices, the TV running war news 24-7. While optimism over the potential result is probably going to be very high. Now obviously this isn't a universal phenomenon, but it does suggest that humans lack the ability to learn from history. Because even though many populations throughout history have believed that this would be a short and victorious war for them and were then proven wrong, we believe that this time it will be different. If it in fact doesn't prove different and the war drags on, generally speaking, populations will tend towards war exhaustion over time. Families will experience casualties, communities will lose people killed and wounded. The economy may experience wartime restrictions, the list goes on. And so for this and many other reasons, wars tend to be biased towards having a finite end point. And so if you're trying to assess how a conflict might play out in the absence of negotiations, estimating each side's vulnerability to war exhaustion is probably a worthwhile exercise. 
All of that analysis is really only about getting you one step closer to predicting potential outcomes and negotiating positions. It's all just one step closer to being able to fill out those percentage chances on those decision-making flowcharts we looked at at the start of this presentation. But if a war has broken out, there's one other set of factors at minimum that you're probably going to want to take account of, whether you're acting as a negotiator, a mediator, or simply an analyst. And that is the actual observed trend of how the war is actually going, and whether or not those trends are likely to continue into the future. This is obviously an imperfect exercise, but it's going to be important in determining how strong your negotiating hand is. Otherwise, you could end up with a scenario where the Japanese call the Americans the day after Pearl Harbor and demand that they surrender. After all, at this point, the US Navy is now outnumbered, outgunned, and losing, statistically speaking, hundreds of aircraft and dozens of ships destroyed or damaged per day. A sober American negotiator might push back by pointing out that the carriers are intact, the American industrial base is beyond the ability of the Japanese to attack, and that given enough time, there is only one way this thing is about to end. With the US economy putting every weapon system you can think of on auto-build and drowning their opponents in a tide of production. Now, my big warning here is you need to be careful when you're dealing with trends. Although if you don't feel like being careful, I can also tell you how to write some incredibly clickbaity headlines. And all it takes is four simple steps. Step one is to identify an important factor and a recent trend. This can relate directly to your field of expertise. So if you're a demographics expert, this might be population growth or population aging. If you're in manufacturing, maybe this relates to the production of some critical material or input. For example, you might say the population of the United States is rapidly aging. Or maybe you're into cryptocurrency and you say, hey, this new shitcoin number 30 has multiplied 10 times in the last week. Step two is to extrapolate that recent trend out to infinity. So you say country X will suffer economic collapse because of a lack of workers, or that we should all dump our money into shitcoin 30 because by these recent numbers, by the end of the year, its market capitalization will obviously exceed that of the entire global economy. To the moon, bro. Hoddle. And if anyone from ASIC is reading the transcript of this episode, please note the heavy sarcasm. Step three is just to write a headline showing that that recent trend extrapolated from infinity proves that the country, industry, or whatever it is in question is doomed or destined to succeed or whatever overdramatic headline you want to write. Step three is supported by step four, which is to never account for systems attempting to adapt or correct. You have to assume that countries will never raise their retirement age or immigration or find alternative solution to demographic issues that people will never ask whether or not a shitcoin is really worth more than the total output of the entire human race, or that markets won't respond to supply chain issues by trying to create more diversified supply chains or other forms of adaptation. This point around the way systems respond or adapt is an important one, because if you're trying to assess how an opponent will fight if a war continues and what your negotiating position should be, you have to both be aware of the observed trends, but also the fact your opponent is probably going to try and respond to them. So once you've pieced together all of the available data, once you have an understanding of the military capacity of both sides, their negotiating positions, their tolerance to pain, the likely trends of the conflict, and everything else besides, you're in a position to finally make a decision. All else being equal, if you assess yourself to have the greater resources, the greater will to continue, the conflict is trending in your direction, and your opponent's demands are unreasonable or unbearable, then it's probably going to be time to dig in your heels. Or at the very least, negotiate from a position of strength. If you and your opponent are both perfectly logical and seeing the same facts, you and your opponent both pick the most logical option available to you and the chips fall where they may. My key issue with simplified game theory style models like this one is that they're usually constructed in a way that assumes rational decision making by both sides. The assumption often is that states will make the decision that is ultimately in their strategic interests. As history all too often shows, however, that isn't always the case. Nations do not always act rationally, often doing things like, for example, fighting on well after the writing was well and truly on the wall. And part of the reason for that is that states are not ultimately maximally logical monolithic constructs. Until ChatGPT's distant descendants eventually take over, states are run by humans. They are populated by humans, and as a result are often as logical as, well, humans. <laughs>
And more than that, different elements of the state might have fundamentally different interests in how a war should be conducted and how and if it should end. On one hand, you might think about the relatively objective, hard strategic interests of the state as a whole, the things you would care about if you're playing a turn-based strategy game. Things like the territory a nation controls, its economic prosperity, its international influence, the well-being of its population. These sort of indicators are often used as markers for strategic success, for many reasons, including the fact that they're relatively easy to measure compared to intangibles like freedom or self-determination. If you started from scratch and asked someone to build a game theory-style model to understand when countries would declare war or accept peace, they'd probably focus on these kinds of factors. What will war cost in terms of lives, treasure, influence abroad, and what will it potentially gain? The problem is, if you rely on these sort of hard factors to explain state behaviour, you're probably going to be disappointed and struggle to explain a lot of human history. If anything, you'd probably expect that a lot of wars would end sooner, given that war tends to be incredibly expensive and destructive, and so you'd expect combatants to be pretty proactive in trying to achieve some sort of settlement once war breaks out. But the abstract concept of the state doesn't make strategic decisions. Governments do. And I'm sorry if this is a controversial statement to anyone in the audience, but the interests of those in government don't necessarily have to align with the strategic interests of the state. A king or a president might be responsible for acting in the best interests of the state, but they're also going to have their own personal motivations, a desire for personal survival, re-election, power and wealth, for example. And there are situations where those incentives can misalign with national ones. For example, a war may be a terrible idea for the country as a whole, but it might be a great way to distract the domestic population from other things that are going on and, as a result, protect the politician's position. Corruption in military supply contracts may be terrible for the country and for military and strategic outcomes, but it may be absolutely fantastic for the property portfolios of the various ministers and influential figures involved. And so throughout history, you can see examples of rulers making decisions that are within their personal interests, not national ones. For example, when Richard the Lionheart was taken prisoner, his captors demanded a ransom equal to one and a half times the total annual incomes of the Kingdom of England. Now, if you're talking about the cold strategic interests of the Kingdom of England, it's probably much cheaper to get a new king than it is to pay one and a half times your total annual income to get the old one back. But it was very much in the interests of Richard and his family to get Richard back, and so the ransom was paid. You'd have to imagine that sort of situation is more likely to occur in an autocratic system than it is in a democracy. Adjusting for modern British government incomes, for example, that would be kind of like Rishi Sunak being kidnapped and his captors demanding a ransom of 1.5 trillion Great British Pounds. Now, I don't want to speak for any Brits who might be listening. But it does occur to me that, given the choice on one hand to defund the NHS for the better part of a decade and leaving people to die on the streets, and on the other hand making a very principled declaration that you will not negotiate with terrorists and instead just getting a new Prime Minister, then maybe, just maybe, you might not see a repeat of the Richard the Lionheart experience. More seriously, there are a variety of reasons that the leadership of a country, particularly in an autocracy, might lead to a country continuing a war or conducting one in the first place, even if it doesn't make sense from the broader strategic perspective of that country. Self-preservation, for example, can be a significant motivator. This can be due to internal or external pressures. Let's just say, for example, a leader is charged with war crimes internationally as a result of their actions during a conflict. If they are offered a peace deal which is otherwise beneficial for their country but which demands that they be handed over to see trial, they're going to have a pretty strong incentive to refuse, even if it makes sense for their country. Alternatively, the war might be the only thing holding back domestic political opposition. During a war, ultranationalists, for example, are probably going to be focused on defeating your opponent. But if you accept defeat and end the war, you might become the target for their political ire. You might save your country and its soldiers and its economy considerable suffering, but you may also be setting yourself up for a rendezvous with a lamppost. At its most depressing, this sort of perverse incentive might manifest in a leader pursuing something like a sense of personal destiny or a desire to write their name in the history books, even if that place is only won through the sacrifice of a generation of young men.
Alexander the Great, for example, reportedly marched half his army through the Gedrosian Desert, losing a third of them in the process. Now you might be asking, what was the reason to make such an immense sacrifice? Was it to outflank an enemy army, to win a decisive victory, to save lives that would have otherwise been expended in battles that he could instead avoid? And the answer to all of that is no. Instead, one working theory is that the reason Alexander marched through the desert is because another ancient ruler, Cyrus the Great, had famously failed to do so. It's hard to argue that ancient Macedon's best strategic interests were well served by its king deciding to sacrifice veteran troops in an attempt to get into the ancient equivalent of the Guinness Book of Records. The reality is there are often cases where nations can survive a peace treaty, but the nation's leadership can't. And in those cases, it's arguably the perverse incentive of those in charge that can lead to the war perpetuating unduly long. At the other end of the spectrum, from the rulers of the government, you have the wider population. And the population is going to have their own perception and opinion on a war or a struggle. They're going to be sensitive to or influenced by other factors, by what the government says, by how many casualties are suffered, by how much damage the economy is taking. But at the end of the day, their attitude towards a particular war doesn't have to derive directly from hard strategic factors. And there are plenty of examples throughout history of populations taking stances that you could argue, strategically speaking, weren't necessarily rational. At one extreme end of the spectrum, for example, people can adopt the idea of peace at any price, the idea they want a war to end literally no matter what the demands of the opponent are. This was the Bolshevik line in Russia in the later years of World War I. And you can still see it in modern days whenever someone suggests that a defender should simply surrender to an attacker under all circumstances to avoid bloodshed. Personally, I've never figured out how you're meant to deter aggression if you're never willing to fight back, but to each their own. At the other end of the spectrum, there are cases of populations in history deciding to fight on to the end, even when the writing is on the wall. Usually this is correlated with people deciding that a principle or an idea is worth more than hard considerations like self-preservation or economic prosperity. The attitude of the population can influence the decisions made by the government and also by other poles of society. It's going to be risky to declare a general mobilization with a viciously anti-war population. And on the flip side, it's going to be difficult to negotiate concessions in a peace deal if the population is vehemently in favor of fighting on to the end. Just how important the opinion of the population is is going to differ based on the political system in place. If it's a democracy and there are elections, then obviously there is a very real connection. But even in autocracies, I'd argue there's a risk in going against the will of the majority if you push things too far. You can also think of the military itself as its own pole or component of society, and an important one when you're talking about waging war. After all, when you're talking about creating combat power and applying pressure to your opponent, these are going to be the people doing it. They're also the people with an awful lot of guns, so if they do happen to turn against the government, well, you can end up with thunder runs to Moscow, which are not great for political stability. In some cases, it's useful to split the interests of junior personnel up from the military elite, the generals and the colonels. But the key point is that the interests of the military may not always align with the interests of the population, the government, or the state as a whole. Now, at this point, you might ask yourself a relatively simple question. Who, or which of these groups, is responsible for ending wars, making that decision? On one hand, the answer is simple. Under ordinary circumstances, government is the one that decides to end a war in cooperation with government or whoever is representing the other side. But in a wider sense, any of these groups, any of these poles of society, might have the capacity to influence or even force an end to a war. At first, it might simply be small acts of pressure, say, for example, small anti-war protests by the population. But in extremis, any of these actors can theoretically collapse a state and a war effort. You can't keep fighting if the general population launches a general strike or a revolution. You can't keep going if the military mutinies refuses to fight or tries to stage a coup. And while everyone is busy ignoring those hard strategic and economic factors, if the economy just implodes, then good luck fighting an industrialized war whether you want to or not. These sort of outcomes are often collapse-style scenarios. And in that sort of scenario, the outcome is unlikely to be good and your opponent is very likely to just take the win. After all, if your army just packs up and goes home, well, that's going to make their job a lot easier. 
After the Bolsheviks took power in Russia, for example, and the previous government collapsed, they managed to obtain peace with the Central Powers by signing the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. But the cost of that peace was to cede territory in Poland, the Baltic states, Ukraine and elsewhere to the Central Powers. And if it hadn't been for the eventual victory of the Western Allies, that is where the borders of the Soviet Union would have been drawn. Given how dire the consequences of this sort of collapse might be, you'd expect it to often be back of mind for most leaders fighting a serious war. And here's the thing. Even if you take account of all of these clashing interests and motivations, even if you try and make allowances for the fact that the opposing government might be trying to make decisions that are more in their personal interest than their state's interest, there are still other human imperfections which might get in the way of a potential peace. And one big problem is you can have situations where combatants both agree that negotiations should reflect the realities on the ground, but what they can't agree on is what those realities actually are. Political and military leaders may have a sober understanding of the realities on the battlefield, their industrial capacity, and how their opponents are likely to respond to their escalations in the future. Or they might be about as tethered to reality as the bloke in the office who's consumed some interesting substances in his time and now believes the government is run by alien lizards. To illustrate the problem here, let's return for a moment to the brave nations of Kiwiland and Emutopia. For more than a year now, Emutopia has been pouring resources into supporting so-called separatists on the Kiwiland South Island. The costs of the war for Emutopia are not insignificant in terms of donated military materiel, the lives of volunteers, and the cost of keeping the forces supplied and paid. The international community has largely sanctioned Emutopia for its alleged aggression, and a sober assessment of the military situation suggests that unless something dramatic changes, eventually the Kiwis will be successful in reclaiming the South Island. Logically speaking, at this point, Emutopia should probably pursue a peace deal. In exchange for the withdrawal of all Emutopian support for the so-called separatists, the Kiwi landers might be willing to offer guarantees and amnesties to some of those involved, an end to international sanctions, and a return to peace. It doesn't give the Kiwis everything they want, but at the same time it saves them the cost of fighting this war for as long as it takes. It's also, logically speaking, a fair deal one Emutopia should accept. The problem, however, is that the Prime Minister of Emutopia doesn't like hearing bad news. In fact, his response to bad news is so aggressive that the rumours say he might even be half cassowary. And so he surrounded himself with advisers and experts who know how to tell him exactly what he wants to hear. And so within the halls of the Prime Ministerial Palaces, everything is going according to plan. The Kiwis' military resources are being worn down over time. Their losses are fantastic, absolutely unsustainable. The Emutopian economy is handling sanctions well. Meanwhile, the population of Kiwiland yearn to join with Emutopia. They're sick of war, and they may be weeks or months away from revolution. In fact, the only reason that Kiwiland continues to resist is because it's really under the control of foreign puppet masters and that once nations like Freedom Land get sick of sending money and resources to the losing Kiwis, eventually they will abandon their Kiwi puppet, Emutopia will be victorious and get everything it asked for and more. Forget complex models with multiple potential outcomes. There is in fact only one nearly inevitable result. If the Emus carry on just that little bit longer, a glorious victory will be theirs. And so the war drags on, even if logically speaking, it should already be over. And if the gap in perception is wide enough, it might continue until one of two things happens. Either perceptions shift and both sides begin negotiating from a more similar set of assumed facts, or eventually objective reality proves that you cannot ignore it forever. And whether you like it or not, something eventually breaks. But fortunately for humanity as a whole, somehow despite all of those challenges and perverse incentives, wars eventually do tend to come to an end. And so now that we've talked about how to predict how a war and negotiations might play out, it's time to talk about some of the end states that a war can finally reach. And for the purposes of simplicity and time, we'll divide these into a few key categories. On one hand, I could achieve all of my original goals and make no concessions in return. You could drive your enemies before you and impose your will upon them. This you could call victory. If you think about this in terms of our model from earlier, it's one where the opponent eventually agrees, through fair means or foul, to my original war goals. Note that this doesn't have to mean a Reichstag scenario where my soldiers raise their flag over the enemy capital. 
All it requires is I'm able to get all or essentially all of what I wanted in exchange, implicitly or explicitly, for ending the war. And indeed, if my war goals are very limited, that is, it will cost the opponent very little to give me what I want, then the amount of coercion required may not be excessive. Victory can follow from a long grinding war to a state of total and near mutual exhaustion, or indeed it can come relatively quickly. The Anglo-Zanzibar War of 1896, for example, took place over, depending on which source you believe, between 38 and 45 minutes. After the death of a pro-British sultan, an anti-British candidate, who may or may not have been responsible for the death of the previous ruler, decided to declare that he was in charge and barricade himself in the palace. This was actually the second time he had attempted to declare himself ruler, having backed down on a previous occasion, but this time he dug in his heels. Now, whatever you think of Britain these days, remember, this is 19th century Britain. They are basically the raid boss of the 19th century. And they sent Halid an ultimatum to back down. He sent back a message refusing and saying, we do not believe you would open fire on us. The British responded saying that they would certainly do so. And just after the ultimatum expired, the Royal Navy opened fire, promptly knocked out all of the defending artillery, following which the claimants sought asylum in the German embassy. Most of the local townspeople sided with the British, a new candidate was installed, and the entire war was considered over within less than an hour of it commencing. In the absence of a decisive economic, military, or political advantage, however, a country may not get everything it wants to out of a conflict. Indeed, even with them, it may have to make compromises. That means whether you have the advantage or not, you're going to have to sit down at the table with your ostensible opponent and try and come to some sort of deal. Now, the results of negotiations can owe a lot to the relative positions of power between the two actors. How is the war currently going? How is it expected to go in the future? How costly is continuing the war for both sides? And how willing are both sides to absorb those costs? But as much as game theory is a science, negotiation can be an art. And as a result, the skill and psychology of the negotiators and leaders involved can play a significant role in the final outcome. Negotiators will of course have to fight each other over the concessions to be made by both sides, who gets what percentage of what they originally wanted, and what are they giving up in return. And depending on how that negotiation process goes, the fighting can die down in a number of ways. The most permanent potential scenario is official conflict termination, a peace treaty, an official end to the war. Now obviously this doesn't mean an agreement to never wage war against each other ever again for all time. But it does usually mean both sides sitting down and agreeing in writing a new state of affairs, even if it isn't the one either of them wanted at the beginning of the war. That might mean things like mutual acknowledgement of who owns what particular piece of territory, what monetary reparations one side might pay to the other, or what other conditions, if any, might be imposed on one or more of the parties. The treaties Germany signed to formally end the First World War, for example, acknowledged French ownership over Alsace-Lorraine, accepted limitations on the size of the post-war German military, and agreed to pay significant monetary reparations to the Allies. This, of course, turned out perfectly and guaranteed peace in Europe forevermore. Jokes aside, while a formal peace agreement doesn't guarantee perpetual peace forevermore, it might provide an opportunity to normalise diplomatic relations, encourage economic investments, and officially at least remove some points of contention between the two or more competing powers. A formal agreement on borders, for example, might reduce the risk, all else being equal, of future border skirmishes. The problem with trying to get this sort of more permanent conflict termination in place, however, is that you need both sides to be able to agree to the content of the peace treaty and sometimes that's just not possible. And so instead, you might end up with a situation which looks more like a ceasefire than a permanent peace treaty. This might occur, for example, where neither side can agree on what final territorial border should be, or agree to relinquish their rights, or whatever other grievance might be in place. But they can agree that for the moment at least, they would like to stop shooting at each other. So they set a temporary line, reserve all of their rights, and agree to let the guns fall silent for now. In this case, the war is not so much terminated as it is on pause. And if that sounds familiar, well, it's a relatively good description of the situation in Korea, for example, where the war between North and South has never technically ended, both still have significant competing claims, but both have agreed to a temporary line of demarcation to establish a demilitarized zone and to not shoot at each other, for now, mostly. 
The intention with the ceasefire may simply be to set conditions for future peace negotiations, or it may endure for years or decades, with Korean troops staring at each other across the demarcation line while North Korea continues its long-running missile campaign against local sea life. Technically speaking, you don't really even need a ceasefire agreement for fighting to stop. Instead, in some cases, you can have situations where the fighting just dies out on a sort of implicit agreement to stop shooting, but there's no formal agreement to stop doing so. Some so-called frozen conflicts feature official ceasefires, but not all of them do. And in some parts of the world, the only thing keeping the quiet and the peace is the trigger discipline of a bunch of 18 and 19 year olds guarding the border. But even that arguably isn't the most dystopic option. Because if no side has a willingness to concede, the negotiators can't get anywhere. Then under normal circumstances in a high intensity war, you'd expect that eventually one side would get tired of it and be forced to concede or suffer complete economic or military collapse. Alternatively, however, a conflict can simply become less intense but ongoing. And if the consumption of ammunition, materiel, manpower and money becomes low enough, then it might reach the point where it's sustainable for both sides. The relatively low intensity of the war means that neither side might have a strong incentive to bring it to an end. And so, like much of the low intensity and irregular fighting you see in places like the Middle East, it may continue for years or decades, with both sides deciding that the continuous but low cost in human life is preferable to making the kind of concessions that would be necessary to secure a lasting peace. But at the start of this episode, I said your job was to try to end a war, not fight a forever one. And so I want to close out by talking about some steps that nations can take to increase the odds of a peace. Now, yes, sometimes the answer might be bombing one side until they agree to give up. But I'm talking here more generally about trying to increase the odds that a peace deal is struck and a war is terminated. The key caveat, as always, is this is just personal opinion based on historical examples and the kind of model thinking we've just talked through. The first thing to say is that just telling both sides to negotiate might not achieve anything, because in a lot of cases, their respective war aims are going to be so far apart that no amount of negotiating time can possibly bridge them. When Hitler invaded the Soviet Union in 1941, there were probably people out there arguing that Stalin should negotiate. But given that the German war aims included mass annexations and depopulations, getting a deal under those circumstances probably would have been something of a long shot. Now, as a general rule, a war is more likely to end the closer together what both sides are willing to accept becomes. And so making that happen, even if it requires providing support to one side or the other, might be a path towards shortening a conflict rather than extending it. The second point is to try and make sure everyone is operating with a realistic understanding of the situation. Optimism and pessimism bias are both dangerous because both can convince you that you don't need to take necessary steps to bring about a satisfactory peace. Optimism bias because it tells you you don't have to take action to get the necessary results, and pessimism bias because it tells you there's nothing you can do to achieve the necessary results. Beliefs that don't align with reality can push both sides apart and cause suboptimal decision making. And so those ideas where possible should be hunted down and destroyed. No, the Afghan National Army is not almost ready to fight the Taliban. The Russian special military operation in Ukraine is not going according to plan. And yes, Ukraine does need those munitions if they're going to continue the fight. The key here for analysts and advisors is to give decision makers the most accurate possible view of reality and never to fall into the trap of just telling people what they want to hear. Having done that, you want to, where possible, reduce uncertainty over potential outcomes. If a nation thinks by fighting on there's a 10% chance they get what they want and a 90% chance they don't, they might still be tempted to take the shot at the 10. But if it's clear that no matter what, they're not going to achieve their original goals, then they're going to be more likely you would expect to negotiate. To give the classic example from Ukraine, one of the most credible ideas behind a Russian theory of victory is that if they just make the war last long enough, eventually Western support for Ukraine will drop away and that then, once that support drops away, they can grind out some sort of victory against the Ukrainian military. Now, obviously, that isn't a certain outcome, but they may view it as probable enough as worth taking a chance on. And so the obvious countermeasure there is to lock in significant amounts of long-term aid now, 
It's committing equipment and putting it into the pipeline, even if it won't arrive until 2024, 2025 or 2026. All else being equal, you'd expect that to reduce the temptation to continue the war on the off chance that support drops away and a victory of sorts can be achieved that way. It's in part for that reason that US decisions to send things like DPICM cluster munitions mean so much. For both sides in this war, artillery ammunition is one of the most critical inputs to combat power, and also one of the greatest restrictions. In saying they are willing to open up the cluster munition stockpile, the US isn't just committing an effective weapon system, although cluster rounds certainly are effective. What they're doing is opening up a large stockpile of weapons that the United States itself was likely never going to use or was in the process of demilitarizing. In 2019, US documents suggested a total cluster munition stockpile of roughly 440,000 tons. And while that is a mixture of multiple systems, some of which are waiting to be demilitarized, when an individual shell might only run to 45 kilograms, you can imagine how deep those bunkers might go. And so in any logical Russian calculus, you have to assume that every time a decision like this is announced, the assessed odds of a victory won by outlasting Western aid and by extension Ukraine decrease somewhat. Past that point, a mediator may or may not be useful. You may notice when conflicts break out that there's no shortage of nations volunteering to be mediators. Now, there's a variety of reasons for that, ranging from genuine belief in negotiations as the best possible solution to any problem, to the fact that mediation can provide international prestige, visibility, and also provide cover or justification for a country failing to take an overt side in a conflict. Mediators can potentially be at their most useful when countries want to have negotiations at arm's length, when they want to keep the lines of communication open but do not want to be seen to be openly negotiating. International powers can then provide incentives for both sides to reach a deal. Security guarantees, economic aid, and other forms of assistance, for example, can help grease the wheels towards a final deal. But in the end, one or both sides are probably going to have to make some difficult decisions. Note that doesn't mean they have to give away the same amount by any means. But you make peace with your enemies, not with your friends. And short of relatively rare total victory scenarios, both sides are going to have to give away at least something in most cases. If you're trying to get your opponent to agree to send their leader to The Hague, for example, that can be a pretty big ask unless you have a very, very large stick in your hand. But even then, there are always going to be cases where there simply is no option for a reasonable deal on the table. In battles for survival, for example, it's kind of hard to meet your opponent halfway. In those cases, I'd argue the negotiation is already taking place with an exchange of gunfire and resources. And for nations observing situations like that, attempting to increase the odds of an eventual peace, the most reliable solutions probably lie in changing the battlefield dynamics and ramping up the strategic costs and pressure. War resolution in the end is ultimately at least a two-player game. And if a party isn't willing to step back and offer a hand on reasonable terms, then sometimes the only sad option left is to try and make them. In conclusion, wars are generally begun and carried on for political or strategic purposes. When they end, it's often as a result of negotiations, but depending on the circumstances involved, negotiations in the absence of coercion and fighting are unlikely to yield results. While game theory would put forward rational models as to how to decide when and how to end a war, that sort of decision-making can be complicated by the fact that people are people and that different groups and individuals can have their own distinct incentives separate from the strategic interests of the state. In the end, the way that a war ends reflects a huge variety of factors, some of which can be influenced by outside parties. But at a basic level, you could argue that resolution becomes more likely the closer the negotiating positions of both sides become, whether that be as a result of talks, economic pressure, or the continued application of military force. Okay, brief channel update to close out, because this is looking like a late release, so I'm trying to push this out quickly. Firstly, thank you to those patrons who voted for this topic. Originally, I was going to make this about the resolution of the war in Ukraine as well, but I decided it was too big of a topic and decided to separate the general theory from the next long-term update on the war in Ukraine. When this goes live, I do expect that there will be some cut content in an effort to make it just a little bit sharper and clearer. One thing I'm looking to do is to start getting into the habit of posting some of that cut content when it exists on Patreon. So if I do end up cutting anything significant from this episode, I might be able to get a clip or two up in the next couple of days. 
As always, I'd like to thank you all for your general engagement with the channel. Whether the topic be Ukraine, defense economics, or a more theoretical one like this, the engagement is always spectacular. It genuinely does mean the world to me, and it gives me confidence to cover a wider array of topics. And so one more time, I'll extend my thanks, and assure you all that I'll see you again next week.